Hello, everybody, and welcome to a, another month of IFAST UNA Q&A, IFAST UNA, IFAST University q and <laughs> It's late in my day. Uh, well, here we have Bill Hartman. <laughs> um, and per the usual, we will ask Stephen to start us <laughs> off. Of course, Steve. Uh, that's all right. I get, get my question out of the way. Um, I only have one. Oh, I got I got a couple, but okay. <laughs> um, I think it was it with the video with Lance, the cutting video where you talked about people. Kind of one of the ultimate goals is just trying to push pressure down into the pelvis for stability. Yeah. Could could you elaborate on that some more? Um, no. No. I pretty much uh, exhausted my thought process on that. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, <clears throat> how, in, in, in what way, is there something specific that you have in mind or, or what do you have in issues with? Um, I, it, like different presentations of maybe extended above the pelvis versus through, I just, I, I don't know. It seems like a, a very broad concept of just wanting to push pressure downwards. Mm -hmm. And I guess what's the, what's the theory behind that? What, what's the benefit of, of that? Well, you need, you need, we need uh, to create pressure to create control. So all of the soft tissues, actually all of the viscoelastic tissues, let's just call them that. All right. Um, are, are manipulated uh, based on pressure, so so uh, fascia, muscle, any connective tissue, bone, all of those things react react to pressure. So so again, we're we're not talking about anything weak um, to those to to any one tissue or any one part. So when we're looking at um, is somebody can somebody mute their? I'm getting weird sounds. Oh uh, man, is that me? Maybe mute it and let's find out. It was you. Thank you. It was really hard to, to think there for a second, Patrick. Okay. Is anybody, real quick, is anybody else here and Bill cut out, like staticky? Just me. Okay. Continue. Am, am I cutting out? It sounds like it. Okay. You're staticky, Lance, but. Okay. Let us back up a moment. Take two. Okay. Now I can't hear anybody. Now that's weird. It seems like I should be at least be hearing Stephen. Can you, can you say something, Stephen? Can I hear you? I can hear you. Okay. I can hear you. Okay. <clears throat> Point being, okay, let's, let's go back to the pressure thing. Okay. So, so all of our tissues are, are, are pressure based. We move through hydrodynamics. Okay. Um, not levers. So everything that we do is pressure based. Joints don't actually touch, right? That's why we have joint spaces. That's why we have synovial joints that are filled with fluid. If the, if the bones actually touched, then we would have a serious problem on our hands because the friction would be very, very high. Temperatures would increase and would destroy cartilage. So everything is a pressure game. How do I create a stable foundation for the extremity? So we're talking about lower extremities if we're talking about cutting. How do I create a, a stable foundation? So the foundation being the, the more proximal tissues, so, so pelvis um, and the surrounding musculature that's, that's part of the axial skeleton and, and the hip. Well, I have to put pressure straight down into the pelvis. So no matter what orientation of the pelvis you provide me, the opening at the top is, is, is it changes very little, right? So I'm pushing pressure straight down into the pelvis and then the position of the ilium is going to guide that pressure in one direction or another, and then the musculature will respond appropriately based on my intent. So if I'm cutting off of one leg, I need a stable foundation for that, for that leg. So typically, so if I'm moving to my left and I'm gonna cut off of my left foot and I plant my, my left foot, the lower extremity will internally rotate, right? That's the loading phase. So that is a, a a uh, rotational motion that actually increases the pressure so I can absorb 
the, the forces associated with the plant, but I have to have something stable above that, which demands that I push pressure down. So I'm pushing my guts down into the pelvis to create a, a less manipulable foundation. So I need a stronger foundation. So if I load any viscoelastic tissue, any viscoelastic tissue um, with a high load or a high rate, the tissue becomes stiffer. Okay, so I have to be able to put pressure straight down into the pelvis at all times. Otherwise, I don't have a stable hip to push off of. So then when I do uncoil the lower extremity, so if I go from the internally rotated position to the externally rotated position to propel myself in whatever direction I'm, I'm choosing, I need something that is stiff to push off of. Okay, because bones bend, bones twist, so do muscles, so does every connective tissue on the planet. But if I need to push off something stiff, I have to have pressure on those tissues of a significant enough load that they are basically firm enough, right? Otherwise, it collapses. It, and, and again, it, it's, it's that simple. If you think of, of all movement, in, in a hydrodynamic uh, or occurring in a hydrodynamic manner, it solves a lot of problems. When you start thinking about levers and things which actually don't exist in the human body, because again, levers need to actually touch the fulcrum, we don't have fulcrums. Um, those are all imagined and, and, and they're single planar and they have equal energy in and equal energy out and we don't have any tissues that do that. So again, they don't exist in humans. Um, it is a pressure game. It is always a pressure game. It has always been a pressure game. We just got to understand how we're manipulating the pressures at all times. Does so that help you at all? Yeah. In, in the example of, uh, you know, maybe loading the left leg and then pushing off the left leg, mm -hmm. um, you mm -hmm. know, in that, I, I know you've talked about the ilium as kind of being rudders to help guide yeah. the, the, the visceral contents. Yeah. In that scenario, in the loading phase, would it be, I'm terrible with the terms, but like you wouldn't have the anterior rotate. It would be a posteriorly rotated nominant in the loading phase. And then relative to what? The sacrum, I suppose. Yeah, I would, I wouldn't, I wouldn't disagree with that. Yeah. I think you're going to have a, a sacrum that moves towards nutation. I think you're going to have an ilium that is moving relatively posteriorly in that regard, because what you're going to need is, is uh, again, we have to look at a stable foundation. So what, what elevates the, the muscles in the, in the bottom of the pelvis? Well, that orientation will allow them to elevate, right? They have to become concentrically oriented. They have to become stiffer. They have to increase pressure. So a concentric contraction increases the intramuscular pressure. An eccentric contraction reduces the intramuscular pressure. In that... Uh, nutation of the sacrum with posterior rotation as a nominant would be like the closed pack position of the SI joint as well while you're loading that leg? I mean, it, it, based on the general understanding of the books that we, we have access to, I, I, would, I would say, yeah. I yeah. mean, you're moving in that direction. But again, keep in mind that, that if, if the sacrum and the ilium actually touched, that would be a bad thing. Okay. Right, so so you're increasing congruence to maximize, or or rather, maybe a better choice of word would be optimize the amount of pressure that goes across that space. We have joint spaces. We do not have, you know, cartilage on cartilage touching. That would be a bad thing. Okay. Right. So everything becomes pressure oriented. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> Bill, can we go further into joints not touching? So I understand that there's, what, let's take um, like the hip, for mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. Synovial fluids inside the hip. Yep. I wouldn't, I can see how the head of the femur would not be directly touching the um, articular surface of that acetabulum. Absolutely so, not. You're correct. So would there still be contact through like the hip labrum? Nope. So femoral there head. There shouldn't be. Are we, are, we, be. are we talking like microscopic level in that there's still. Oh yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah, you're closing. I mean, the, you're, you're, the, the pressure will squeeze the, the 
any um, fluid out of the space, right? But if they touch, that's bad. That's how you, that's destructive, right? Because then, then you have, so theoretically, you're supposed to have a frictionless surface within a synovial joint. Yeah. Right? So if those tissues actually touch, you're increasing friction, which means that you're going to increase heat, right? Which is going to be destructive to anything that, that is relatively, well, to anything, honestly. Yeah. It's because it, it, they're all viscoelastic tissues. They're all, they're all made of the same stuff, the, you know, the, with bone being the exception of having hydroxyapatite, which makes it, makes it a little bit, a little bit uh, harder okay. than the other tissues, but they're all viscoelastic. And so they're all going to be reduced the same way under the right, right forces. Okay. Um, then what about joints that aren't considered synovial? Like let's take like the... Well, then those rules are off, aren't they? So like su- sutures in your skull. Um, uh, don't, don't, don't go there because okay. you don't know. All right. There's, then let's talk there's, about... There's, there's, about- there's, 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 there's a lot of, there's a lot of tension that goes across those, those structures. And if you look at the, there's these tiny little ligaments. So, so you know, how the sutures are kind of like, like a yeah. lock and key kind of a thing, right? So yeah. between, so between, between that arrangement, there are there are ligamentous or there are, let's just call them connective tissues for the sake of argument. Okay, sure. it's been a while since I've actually looked at that. Sure. But, but the the things that connect those are at such an angles that it actually pulls them apart a little bit. Okay, so so you know between any two of the, of these. Uh, of the sutures, the ligamentous tension actually pulls them in opposition and doesn't jam them together. It actually pulls them apart a little then, bit. But I don't. I'm not. I'm not of the. I'm not of the belief that there's like a massive amount of movement in these sutures. Right. I think. I think you've got a, a pressure manipulation issue in skulls. Right. Because that, why, why would all that fluid be in there in the first place if we weren't manipulating that on a regular basis? And I remember you referring it more to. Um, like squeezing a water balloon rather than actual like arthrokinematic actions happening. Right. To, to a certain degree, I would agree with that. Yeah. But then let, let's discuss a joint like proximal tib fib where it's, mm-hmm. where it wouldn't have, um, it's, it's not synovial. So mm-hmm. it's, it's, so if an open anything that's joint. not synovial, so like, so the first rib is that attaches to the mubrium is not a synovial joint. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it has, a significantly reduced um, movement capability, right? So if we use the term degrees of freedom, it has a very, very limited degrees of freedom, mm-hmm. okay? Whereas a synovial joint, theoretically, if you really looked at it at the microscopic level, would have this un- unrestricted degrees of freedom. What we do is, so we, we, the, the models that we use to describe anatomy and biomechanics are, are incredibly simplified because it is so complex sure. to even consider. So the minute you take levers and fulcrums off the table, it becomes incredibly difficult to describe movement, right? Sure. So we use a, a Euclidean form of geometry to, to explain everything that we can. The problem that we run into, though, is that these forces that we're exposed to on a regular basis are so freaking extreme that, that theoretically they should just destroy you, and they don't. Sure. We absorb them quite well. Just watch, watch any parkour video on YouTube and watch some of the landings these guys take. Yeah. Right? And then they're going you know, off like three story buildings. Yeah. And they, well, they hit and roll. And so, yeah. so what the roll does is it distributes the force throughout the body and throughout yeah. the tissues. And so they get this massive vibration that, that they can distribute. <clears throat> nothing gets hurt because nothing absorbs the tip absorbs the forces long enough and they just have to roll long enough and effectively enough to distribute the load. So, that, you know, otherwise like your legs would shatter if you landed from a jump like that and didn't, didn't dissipate the forces or didn't have viscoelastic tissues to do that. Okay. Um, have you ever heard of, what was it? The dash pod effect in like hydraulics? Is that similar to what we're kind of discussing here? Say it again. Dash pod effect in hydraulics. I remember I I was reading, no, it's essentially like if you try to take, like if you try to take a, a pump and a bike a, a bike pump and like the faster you push down on it, the more resistance you're going to get from it. Is that right. kind of similar to what we're discussing? Oh, here? sure. I understand what you're saying now. Okay. Yeah, kind of. I mean, the, the, the example I always use is silly putty. Right? Yeah. 
if you, mm -hmm. if you if you pull silly putty very slowly it stretches if you pull it really really fast it snaps in very clean lines right and and so think about you know all the 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 tendon injuries that that there has ever been it's like how does that how does that work it's, it's like you load it fast enough in the at the right angle and at the right time that the tissue becomes so stiff that it that it literally fractures you know versus like a, a normal kind of a stretch or or whatever you might be placing on those tissues okay um all right i think i was more i was more referring to that in like like a synovial joint where yeah no i'm but it's it, it, a force into the synovial fluid rather yeah, than yeah no i, no, I I'm, I'm with you as okay. long as so as long as the synovial membrane is intact and the, and the fluid is contained then you have normal synovial joint mechanics, right? So if I put pressure on the two bones and I jam those bones together and I have a, as an intact synovial membrane, absolutely. And what's going to happen in, under those circumstances? Well, that increases joint stability now, doesn't it, right? So what about instances where you get um, people either recovering from like joint surgeries or they need to go intra-articular? Like any ACL reconstruction yep. surgery where they have to disrupt yep. it's a problem isn't it yeah yeah that's kind of a big deal okay i mean that. yeah no i mean it, it, that's that's a very legit concern so just get an, a just a plain old <clears throat> knee scope where they where they make two portals in the front of the knee right mm. they're poking right through the synovium so until that synovium heals you don't have normal joint mechanics okay right yep because you don't have you don't have a, a solid container. You have, and if have you ever seen a, a knee surgery, like a live knee surgery? Uh, like on YouTube. Not okay. Live, so but. so they they make the portals and they fill it they fill it with fluid to expand the joint, and you see yeah. the water shooting out of the yeah, sure. of the portals, right? Yeah. So guess what? That is no longer an intact synovial membrane. So again, until that that mechanism is re restored, you're at risk for for other issues that are associated with with you know um, not being able to control the pressure inside the joint. Could that also be a potential explanation for why there's swelling during like an inflammatory phase of the joint? Well, I mean, it's going to contribute, right? Because you're damaging tissue in a, in, a, in essence to repair whatever they're they're in there to to do, right? Mm -hmm. And so, absolutely, of course, it's got to heal just like everything else does. Is it gonna? Is the effusion going to leak out? Yes, absolutely, it will. So, so now it's going to be in the the interstitial spaces outside of the synovial membrane. Sure. Okay. That, but that happens with almost any injury. I mean, how do you get? How do you get swelling up up the mid calf from a really bad ankle sprain, right? I mean, it's just going to distribute into the interstitial space. Right. It's it's, follow, it's going to follow the the gradients, right? But the, all all that swelling is also from like you get vaso vasodilation in that area because it's trying to bring fluid to that area. It's not just synovial fluid and other fluid leaking. No, 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 no. You're having a normal inflammatory reaction too, yeah. right? So, so that's obviously a contributor, but again, I don't know how you rule out one or the other okay. like I said, until that's intact. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Uh, it makes you wonder about the accelerated protocol sometimes, doesn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I agree. I mean, and, and, and I don't, I don't know what the answer is as far as, how big a deal it is and how much um, you know pressure loss there is associated with that I haven't really looked it up but it's definitely a thought that's in the back of my head but then you also you also have all that literature where it's buttressing the accelerated program just because all the loading and the increasing in the movement seems to be accelerating that rehab process rather than being deleterious to it yeah but but you know if you look at you know, there's there's a, there's a few big deals that are associated with with some of these surgeries. So, in the early phase of ACL rehab, in the first seven to ten days, if you want to get range of motion back very very quickly, and I'm talking like heel to butt knee flexion and normal hyperextension in in less than a month, you better control the joint swelling immediately after surgery. Right. You know, it's not about getting up and starting to walk on it and accelerating your, your recovery. It's like, you got to manage that sucker because if you don't, then you're going to be dealing with issues for a very, very long time. Right. Right. So, so again, you know, you don't want to, 
I mean, you got to think in your phases, your your recovery phases after something like that. Okay. But, but I'm certain, I'm certain that the destruction that takes place in the knee has a heck of a lot to do with that. That's interesting. Yeah. What would be um, good sources to kind of, what, what, what have you been kind of, grasping all of this from and anatomy sure but i mean so taking like hydrodynamics and so water you have to understand how water works sure right? and you have to understand a little bit about pressure so i know under, i'm like i'm i'm not a physicist by any stretch of the imagination and i'm i'm learning that rather aggressively as i try to delve deeper into you know hydrodynamics and things like that so i understand how the pressures do move but but once you understand you know where where the 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 fluid volumes are and how you manipulate them to actually move and then you understand how viscoelastic tissues behave and you just start to put the pieces together and you say uh oh you know it's and it's not like people have been lying to us or anything like that it's just the fact that that we just needed a model so we could communicate so we could actually understand each other and right. and and a, a purely mechanical geometric model was the was the more obvious solution rather than saying oh you have infinite degrees of freedom in a joint and we'll just say oh no no you actually have three right and and so it's easier for me to say sagittal plane frontal plane and transverse plane because that that gives you again it gives us a, a, a common language to speak when i Versus when I tell you there are infinite planes to joint movement. And now it's impossible for us to have a conversation. And how have you been um, almost translating some of this stuff to your patients? Um, I, you I, 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 well, you know, it, during your subjective is your, as you're establishing your rapport, you sort of get an idea of where, like where they've been. So uh, the, some of the questions I ask, Hey, what sports did you play? Um, and, and I'm not going to go into what we just talked about. I'm not going to say, oh, you move by hydrodynamics. And so, right. you know, it, it doesn't go there. But I do talk a little bit about pressures because I have to, because then they're going to wonder, it's like, okay, why am I using respiration as, as a component of my treatment? True. Why do I have to shift into this position? So but what happens when I shift into this position? Where, you know, and we talk about you know, where, you, where you sense high pressures Okay, which is a concentrically oriented muscle, and where do you sense the lower pressure so you know where you're pushing stuff? So, you know, if I need somebody to be able to to rotate the upper thorax better, then I need them to be able to feel that 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 upper rib cage, whichever side of them I'm trying to get them to turn to. I need them to feel the expansion there. Well, that's an area of low pressure, which means that I have to create an area of high pressure somewhere else to push the air in that direction, right? So they do need to have a little bit of an understanding of that, but you don't have to go into that kind of detail. Right. Otherwise, it's just, I mean, you're, you're talking way over their head or you're talking about something that is just so far from their story that, that they won't grasp it at all. So, so you're still using a very, very mechanical explanation without deviating from the truth. Sure. Okay. Have you, how do you deal with people that are almost giving you blowback with it or like lack of understanding or still essentially just like not believing you, I guess, in a way, simply well, because they don't understand how right. all this is working. Well, I mean, first of all, you ask them, does that make sense? And then, then they would say yes or no. And then you, you delve a little bit deeper and, okay. and you allow them to ask any question that, that they need to ask. And you do your best to, to answer that as, as truthfully and effectively as you can. Sure. And again, there's a, there's an element of rapport that has to be established, and and sometimes you're right and sometimes you're wrong as as to how you approach it. Um, and uh, um, but I I don't get blowback, right? I I don't you know I'm 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 right. not outrage. Yeah, but I like I said you know during your subjective you're going to learn a little bit about them. You're going to learn a little bit, a little bit about their understanding. And uh, you know I had a guy came in today that was very well researched as to. Uh, his understanding and it was a very mechanical explanation but 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 he had you know took the time and, and wanted to understand what was going on and he just kept asking question 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 and eventually we got a little bit deeper you know towards what we just talked about but i wouldn't go again wrong population as far okay. as as far as uh, you know, what we just talked about does it seem like a lot of your patients are more well read or they have been in no. recent history no yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah. Everybody thinks that, that they can stretch their way out of stuff and anywhere they have pain, they should pull on it. And that, I mean, that's standard operating procedure. It always has been like ever since, ever since I graduated. So, so 27 years worth of, of people all thinking that the solution is the same thing. I mean, even in, even in school with um, some of our professors and we'll even have like guest lectures, they'll still say like, Oh, it's like this old added of, when in doubt, you know, like strengthen what's weak and stretch what's tight. And okay, but why is it weak and then why is it tight? Right. right. Exactly. And, then, and so don't ask those questions. Don't, like, don't delve any deeper. Let's be incredibly superficial. Yeah. And let's take a concentrically oriented muscle and let's drive it harder in, in, that, in that respect and, and um, see what happens. You know, I mean, it's just, it's just a, it's a, it's the wrong solution. Agreed. In almost every respect. Almost. Um, now, when you're talking about concentrically oriented and eccentrically oriented muscles and mm -hmm. a different pressure, mm -hmm. is that you discussing like within the muscle, or are you saying like in the cavity where that? Well, I mean, there's compartmental there. pressures, right? You know, all you need to do is see somebody with like a with like a compartment syndrome in the lower leg and you uh -huh. understand what I mean by, by compartments. So there's uh -huh. compartmental pressures that, that need to be addressed, but there's also pressure within the muscle itself. So a concentrically contracting muscle will actually increase the pressure, right? Because I'm squeezing down on it theoretically, right? So, so the internal pressure increases, but that's how you move, right? Because if I don't have a fulcrum in a joint, I have to create differential pressures across that space to allow the segments to move within and, and again, and um, not against each other, but but um, amongst each other, right? So if I'm bending my elbow, I need to increase the pressure on the on the the front side of the elbow and decrease the pressure posteriorly. Otherwise, the elbow doesn't bend, right? And if I equalize the pressure, now I have what looks like an isometric position of the elbow. Yep. Okay. All right. That's yeah. This is that's actually helping to for this to make more sense now. Now, and I actually wanted to ask you about compartment syndrome and, you know, given this new lens to view things, you know, what's actually going on with that pathology now? That's a really good question. Um, Cause I've had people that have been diagnosed with compartment syndrome cause they can measure it, but it, and it's usually done after activity, but they've also yeah. have what I would consider uh, a limited movement repertoire and so they increase load in certain areas and so again you're going to have I mean obviously you're going to have an increased compartment pressure in a, in an area where the muscles were remaining concentrically oriented doesn't that kind of make sense now yeah. I, we've had that little discussion yeah and so a lot of what you know th there are also issues where maybe you have an, an increase in in the uh, um, extracellular fluid right, that can accumulate and can compartmentalize. And then that's probably a, a much more legit compartment syndrome, right? And then they go in and they slice open the fascia and things like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so um, as for what the cause is, there's probably like a, there's probably, the, the compartment syndrome itself is probably a secondary issue to something else would be my best guess. I mean, without sure. having a, a specific context to talk about. But I mean, I, I had a, a, a female patient probably last year, I think, that came in and, and um, you know, they, she was diagnosed with everything from shin splints to calf strains to whatever, whatever, mm -hmm. right? And compartment syndrome was on the list. And they did do, like they had her exercise and then they measured the, the, uh, the pressures in, in the lower leg. And of course they were elevated. And they stayed elevated for, for quite some time. And, you know, she would get off of her feet and the pressures would go down. And, and uh, all we did was, was restore her regular movement repertoire. And she was able to exercise normally what, within a month. Okay. Uh, so, again, I think that some of this stuff is going to get, get pigeonholed just because of the, the, the point of view of the practitioner has so much to do with how things are are diagnosed how things are treated and, and such and that's why that's why you got to stay a generalist okay yeah yeah they in, in, in all seriousness it's like it's like you know we need specialists no question about that but right. but from my perspective um 
you know, the remaining the generalist is, is the way to go. It's much more interesting. You can draw on so many more things. And then um, because it opens up your perspective, um, it gives you a lot more options. Right. Great. Is, um, the, is the campo show over yet? What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Does, I, Patrick said he had a good discussion. Wait, we'll, we'll come back to you. Patrick said he had a question on Facebook, and 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 uh, I know he's just been dying to uh, to ask. Am I right? Oh, I, I did. I don't. Uh, I I don't know if I did, but I had a quick question on what you guys were talking about. Uh, could you elaborate on what makes the muscle concentrically or eccentrically oriented? Um, so, so um, all muscles are under tension, okay, in regards to our, our position against gravity, right? Case in point, case in point, if I take any muscle and I take a scalpel and I detach it, attach one end from the bone, it shortens, okay? <laughs> Makes sense? Makes sense? Okay. So now if I, if I change the orientation of the body such that I bring the two ends of that muscle closer together, right, I will have a muscle that is now concentrically oriented because it is under tension and it is shortened. So it will, it will be concentric, right? That's a shortening contraction, right? On the opposing side, so if we if we think like pure antagonism, which which probably doesn't exist, but if we just think as as a purely antagonistic, the the muscle that's on the other side of the joint from the concentrically will have to lengthen, right, and it will be under tension as well, so it will be eccentrically oriented, right. So so there's issues mm -hmm. with with pressures inside the muscle. There's there's pressures on the the uh, connective tissues as well. There's pressures and tension that, that, that are on those, those tissues. There's neurologic consequences. So, so the muscle spindles will, will behave differently in the different orientations, right? Um, which makes a concentric muscle a little bit easier to contract than an eccentrically oriented muscle. So now your recruitment patterns, if you will, may be disturbed. All right, to put mildly, um, where now you're, you're e it's, it's just easier to use those, those concentrically oriented muscles, okay? So there, there's a lot of um, um, effects associated just with position, right? But muscles are always under tension. And so all I have to do is, is move two attachments closer together, however I would do that, and I can change the orientation. But neuro, neuro, neurology is gonna do that too, right? So we talk about patterning all the time and, and uh, um, how we manipulate pressures and respiration and all those things are going to affect um, how these muscles are oriented. Does that, does that- So are you happen? saying, yeah, so are you saying that um, certain muscle groups tend to be concentrically or eccentrically oriented. And is that based on their, I guess, their, um, I don't want to say regular, but then their function, I guess their regular function. Like, for example, like the dorsiflexors tend to be working more eccentrically than concentrically. For, for so which, what, what flexors did you say? Oriented. What, what flexors, flexors did you say? Ankle dorsi, ankle dorsi so, flexors. So, what what about them? I'm sorry. So you're there's, saying there's a little background noise. Certain muscle groups tend to be concentrically oriented okay. versus let's 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 make oriented. this an easy example. Let's make this a real easy example that we always use. Okay, if if the pelvis is anteriorly rotated, right, you just mm -hmm. move rec fem into a concentrically oriented position, right? I brought the two ends of the muscle closer oh. together. Okay, the hamstring, which is on the other side, would be eccentrically oriented under those circumstances. Okay, right? so, that so they're not, so, they're so now, muscles aren't okay. always that way, but, but there are positions that will, that will change the orientation, right? Got it. Yeah, okay. that makes sense. Cool. All right. Is that the Aaron Doyle that I see in the in the background? 
What's up, brother? Good morning. How are you, buddy? I'm great. Good to Gentlemen, see you. How are you? Just wanted to say hi. I didn't want to didn't want to uh, interrupt yeah. the the call here, but I haven't seen you in a while, so. Thanks, man. All right. Man. Any questions? Bill, so if we're talking about applying this in, I guess, like a gym setting. Uh huh. So if we're kind of talking manipulating variables, could you say that where you take your inhale and exhale is going to affect your joint position during a movement. So yes. like if I inhale at the bottom of a push up as opposed to the top, I'm going to get two different, I guess, positions going on there. Potentially. Yes. Absolutely. So, so think about, so think about this for a second. Okay. If you take air in, all right, the pressure inside the axial skeleton, because we, because we have a container, right? We've got muscles on the outside. We've got connective tissues. We've got the the you know the peritoneum and et cetera, et cetera, right? We have containers that will that will maintain compartments of of fluid pressure. Absolutely, absolutely. So it would be like um, if if you had a four hundred pound bar across your shoulders, and you were going to do a squat, um, would you want Th that person to exhale? Probably not. No, you got to stay inflated, right? So now you know why powerlifters all look the same when you know because of the way that they squat is because they have to maintain a certain certain level of pressure inside their body at all times as long as that bar's in the back. So yeah, they're moving air in and out, but the amount of pressure that's inside, I mean, I mean, they're really cranking it up, right? Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, it it absolutely does matter. Um, as you're applying it, and so so now you can you can think about and really any exercise that that you're doing that um, you know when we talked about the the cutting concept at the very very beginning, you know if I am in that half kneeling position and depending on how I orient the pelvis and depending on where um, I'm I'm you know um, placing the resistance right? That's going to recruit certain muscle activity. So that, that muscle activity, if it becomes concentric oriented, increases the pressure in that area. And therefore I'm going to be manipulating the pressures, right? So I could take a, a, a simple chop and lift pattern and turn it into anything that I really want it to be based on the orientation of the pelvis, the, the position of the foot, um, the sequence that I'm going to use to, to, to breathe with because I'm, now I can manipulate the pressures and I can either restrict rotation or I can create rotation or however I want to manipulate the foundation from which they're working from the ground up, right? Just changing the foot position changes the pressure, right? Um, we don't talk about it like that. We talk about, you know, stability or instability and, and such, but, but that's what we're doing, right? You know, you, you get somebody with a, with a mushy flat foot, that's a low pressure foot. Right. Mm -hmm. you get somebody with a really high arch, you got a high pressure foot. Right. So, so again, yeah, I mean, whatever we're doing, we can, we can manipulate. You just got to understand like what your intent is, what your goal is, and then a little bit about how to move that pressure around. So could this be like a, it's a higher level way to drive variability in people that may need it in certain areas? Well, but it, but it is variability, right? Is if you're, if you're promoting, um, or, or intentionally restricting, right? Mm -hmm. So again, we're, 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 we're sort of playing with that spectrum. It's like, where do I want, where do I want things to not move and where do I want things to move? And so if, if I want something to move, then um, I need to be able to uh, reduce pressure in that area, right? And then move fluid in that direction. And then that's what's going to cause the movement to occur. So you know, you just think about like real simple stuff, like when we're talking about um, rotation of the thorax. So I need to be able to inflate one side to be able to turn in that direction. And if I can't do that because I've got concentric muscle activity that's closing that space down and creating an air of high pressure, you ain't moving there, right? Mm -hmm. So that means I, I need to flip flop it, right? I need to create pressure elsewhere, reduce that area so the air does flow in that direction and now I can turn. Got it. Okay. Right? Thanks. Yeah, it's that it's not just muscles on the outside that are moving stuff, right? Mm -hmm. people, yeah. people need people need to grasp that concept. It's like, you know, we have forces on the outside of our body. We need forces on the inside of our body. If we don't have forces on the inside of our body, you collapse like a boneless chicken, right? 
There's nothing to hold you up on the inside if you don't have pressure on the inside of your body. That's what holds us up against gravity. It's the only thing that holds us up against gravity. Mm -hmm. Right? And so if we can't yeah. manipulate those, then we suffer the consequences of gravity. Mm -hmm. Gravity's a bitch. It, it does work. All the time. Yes. Thankfully. <laughs> Thankfully. I guess Brandon Brown didn't make it on, huh? Can't hear you, Lance. Still can't hear you, Lance. Lance, aren't you hosting this call? Can't hear you. Does anybody have a question while Lance tries to figure out his sound problem? Uh, do you ever use uh, like Craig's test for femoral aneversion in your exam or any other prone hip rotation measures? Yeah, I mean, I, um, I, I have used the, the, the prone measures, absolutely. It's not like a standard thing because I'm, I'm trying to figure stuff out as quickly as possible, but absolutely. Yeah, there's a, there's a, yeah. So if you think about if I'm, if I'm measuring rotation with hip flexed, I've got a, a ligamentous structure of, of that hip that's, that's loose, right? So it's less of a, of an influence on the outcome. And then if I, if I put you in, in prone, now I'm, I, it becomes more of an issue, doesn't it? So absolutely. Now you, there's no restriction on what you can and can't use, um, you know, in your exam. Um, it, all of it is is influential. Shoulder extension is is important too. I tell you where shoulder extension really comes into play really really well is when you got those people with the multidirectional instabilities in the shoulders. Is use shoulder extension that'll help guide you as well. <coughs> what, what what does the shoulder extension tell you versus? Um, your your other test measures in that scenario. Um, it's 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 more of a like a clarifier, right? So, oh, uh, looking at like anterior capsule yes, mobility. Yes. Of the, Absolutely. Of the like if there's a, if there's ever a question in your mind, start looking there. Yeah. yeah. It, um, how do you how do you use like how do you compare do you compare the prone measures to the seated measures at all to help? Uh, well, make, there's, make make decisions what do you mean by compare because again i'm 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 looking at different i'm looking at a different scenario if i'm if i'm if i've got them in prone mm -hmm. right i've got some muscles that come into play that are that are kind of a big deal um you know it it's a great way to rule in or out on on like something like a the, like the anterior hip musculature like tensor fascia lati anterior glute med stuff i mean it's a it's a nice way to clarify that as well because um, like TFL uh, would be a little bit more on slack if I'm hip flexed. Mm -hmm. Whereas if it's extended, it, it like I said, it, it becomes a little bit more of a bigger deal in regard to that um, hip ER scenario. Um, anterior glute med also falls into that category. I guess the way I've, I've been looking at it is using like the hip flexed measures as like trying to get a, a measure of uh, angle of inclination of the acetabulum mm -hmm. and then using the prone measures to try to figure out more specifically, like if there is a, an, a femoral aneversion, what's, uh, what's happening with, can I make estimations about what's going on with the hip capsule based on angle of inclination of the hip as well as their other test measures? I don't, I don't have a problem with that. I don't have a problem with that. And again, as long as, as long as you're, you're finding it useful and it helps you make a better decision for your intervention and your outcome is better, there's no problem with that at all. Right. Absolutely. But again, I, I, I think it, it becomes important to sort of understand the, the anatomy a little bit. And, and I, you know, when you're looking at, you know, the angle of inclination and things like that. I mean, I like what, I like your thought process a lot. And again, but, but keep in mind that, um, 
just by putting somebody on the table and creating a barrier and all that kind of stuff, your plan, you know, again, that, that that's why I don't have a problem with it. And as long as it's useful, because so there's going to be those times where you put somebody on the table and it ain't going to matter. Right. And, yeah. and, you, and, and maybe you do make a bad decision or you make, maybe you choose the wrong intervention and that's okay too, because it happens all the time. I mean, that, that's just part of, part of treatment. Right. But, uh, but no, I mean, use whatever you need to, to, to make a really, really good informed decision to the, to the best of your ability. And then, you know, you, you take the next step based on your outcome, just like we always do. Cool. Right. Yeah. You know, but as, and again, as long as you're thinking along the lines of, of taking in as much of the anatomy as the, as you can understand, Right. And, and not saying, Oh, this is restricted and tight. I need to pull on this and make it better. You know, that we don't want to be those people. Yeah. yeah. I, I guess I'm trying to use the, the different measures to get as good of a picture of kind of bony structure as I can. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. How is there, can I try to estimate how their acetabulum is oriented and then how does the, how would the femur be oriented in that? And so what, when I was just looking at like hip flexed measures, um, I tested someone's anaversion one day and I was like, I, you know, I totally missed the boat because I didn't, I mean, they had 40 degrees of femoral anaversion and that threw off all their other te test measures. Mm -hmm. I went up, you know, using the mm -hmm. hip measures to, to determine I, pelvic position. I, am, am, am I correct that, that Craig's has like an 80% sensitivity or something like that? Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure. It's, it was, I think I recall it was really high. Don't quote me on that. It's been a long time since. Yeah. And, and I don't, I don't, I don't look at it so much that way because I just think there's just so many potential influences. Um, again, when, a lot of those tests were evolved from, from the premise that we laid somebody down on the table, therefore they're right. symmetrical <laughs> now. And, and, you know, it, we just kind of know better. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's why the, all the motion palpation is, is such a crap shoot, yeah. you know, and uh, um, sometimes you just get lucky. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. Can't hear you, Lance. I'm being serious. I cannot hear you. I had a question about Far away. something you said about how a foot that's flat is a low pressure foot. Yeah. Can you hear me? Do I need, should, I, should I speak up? Say again. So can you hear me? Should I speak yeah. up? Yeah. Yeah. You were, you were just, it's not, it's not a volume thing. It's just that you cut in and out a little bit. Oh, my internet here is not the greatest, mm. but um, so I work with, uh, I work with college basketball athletes and something that we do is we get them to squat and a lot of times we got them we get them to squat very very well and mm -hmm. when they first get here a lot of them they may be very restricted or their squat pattern is just isn't the greatest but we, that's right. something we work on and something that I've noticed is with one of the athletes that he it seems like he's blown completely through his midfoot his feet are extremely mm -hmm. flat mm -hmm. but he does not seem to really have any signs of pain or awesome. yeah, signs, signs of pain yeah um, would you say that his like having extremely flat feet would that be considered a dysfunction for him and would okay do you think it's a dysfunction I don't necessarily think so, and like that's something I've talked to other people about. I don't necessarily yeah. think it's this yeah. reason. I'm just yeah, kind yeah, of yeah, the, worried. Like, do you? Yeah. Like, the, the, do you, the, it's ahead. okay. You're 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 cutting it out again, Patrick. Like um, like do you, you beat the end of your question? Would, just the end of your question. Like the question is like I guess I was just a little worried. Like, do you continue to? work on his squat pattern, develop his squat pattern, knowing that that can continue to push his foot into more and more of a pronated. 
You know, that, that's, that's a really tough call and that's going to be a decision that, that unfortunately I'm going to cast off to you. The question then becomes, okay, how much is he using the, that compensatory activity to achieve what you perceive as a, as a really good squat? And then where is the end barrier? Where do you say, okay, that's enough or that's too much? And I don't know if we know that or not. You know, the fact that he is, he is not dealing with any pain-related issues um, is a great thing. That means he's got enough variability throughout his system that will allow him to do the things that he wants to do as a player and that you want him to do um, as, as uh, an athlete that, that you're instructing. So, but, but I don't know where that cutoff is. And, and, you know, there's some certain measures that we can use the way you look at, you know, navicular distance from the floor and all that kind of stuff. And, and, you know, you can look at some of that research and maybe discern like, okay, where do we need to take this guy? How valuable is it for us to have a really, really good squat in regards to his ability to play his sport? Is that, is that what's important or is it just a matter of, of uh, giving him the tools that he needs to, to, to play most effectively. If the squat adds to that, then, then maybe you continue to work on it and you just monitor this, this foot thing and you say, well, I just don't want it to get any worse because I just don't know where that, that end game is to where you know, that midfoot then becomes a problem. Right? We just don't have those answers. We're not good at that stuff because there is so much variability be built into the rest of the system. But that's that's the tough part of being about being the coach. You have to make that decision, and you you have some information in front of you that that uh, um, that you have to utilize to make those decisions, right? And and for me to say, is it dysfunctional? I'm not a big fan of the whole. You know, I I think that tissues like when you start to change tissues now now you have potential you know um um issues associated with like a like a dysfunction like most people would call it dysfunction i just don't use that word a lot because i think a lot of this is just a normal response under whatever circumstances that you're putting these people in right i mean if if i load your foot a certain way long enough it's going to assume a certain shape and then those tissues will adapt well is that dysfunctional if it makes me better it makes me a better player or does it just screw with me being a normal human which which what what is the best case scenario right what's normal under those circumstances um and not to sound like all you know philosophical and all but i just don't know where those rules really are i mean i've seen some really nasty feet on some amazing players right um and and i would i you know if you'd have just showed it to me and not told me who these people were and what they did i would i would make an assumption that oh this guy can't move and then you go out and you watch these guys and they're amazed we had a running back from notre dame that had some of the ugliest feet i've ever seen and um, no semblance of an arch and he runs like a 4 4 you know it's like what are you going to do about that is that dysfunctional or maybe that's what makes him great where, where do we draw that line and then me looking at a static foot versus that foot under dynamic circumstances do you think that's going to be the same too see i don't think so and again, that might be where the where the disconnect is, is is we're looking at something, you know, a guy walking around barefoot in the in the treatment room versus a guy that is moving at high rates of speed under very specific circumstances and then has an amazing skill um, that allows him to to execute either with those same circumstances that we saw in the static position or a totally different dynamic foot. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. It's just, it was just something that was on my mind. Yeah, it's. I mean, and, and it, it's it's a it's a horrible answer, but I think it. I think I'm being honest in 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 regards to the answer. Is that is that for me to say? Oh, it, do you need to fix that? Oh, I don't know if you need to fix that kind of a thing. You know, I think there's a lot of things that we see that we go, oh, I don't like the way that looks, and then we make an assumption that there's something bad about it when the reality is 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 the guy's perfectly fine, right? I don't know what 10 years from now or 15 years from now or 20 years from now, if that's still going to be fine or not. But under the circumstances, you know, those are the things that you document, you monitor, you measure as best you can, and then you make the best decision that you can. And then you play it out and you see what happens. Another question that I was wondering is, is it possible that movement quality, especially in the weight room, is it possible that it can be a, something that's very overrated because there's a lot of times where I see someone in, in the gym, like 
he would be he people would uh, classify him as like a terrible mover, a terrible athlete. But he gets in his in his on the court and like he's an amazing athlete. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So like I guess yeah. what, what what's the line what, for what's most important? What's most important? What are you doing on the court? Well, hell yeah, right? <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, and I, and I kind of know what you're saying, but I think that, that, you know, you're making a judgment as to what is good and bad in a, in a much more isolated scenario than, than what he performs in. Right? Mm-hmm. Maybe he's uncomfortable in that context. Maybe he just doesn't have the capacity to do that. And, and so what the, the lesser... Uh, restrictions that the sport provides allows him to um, self-organize a little bit more effectively and produce the outcome that he wants. Whereas you're, you're creating such a restrictive scenario where you say, no, it has to fall within this line and this scale and has to look like this. And, and that's just not in, in his um, capabilities. Right. So I think you have to give athletes credit for being athletes a lot of times. And, and recognize the fact that, okay, they're good. And then you just fall back on what you know best. And like I said, I think you do a lot of monitoring and a lot of uh, rechecks and such to determine, okay, is this changing? Is this looking like it's in my mind and my understanding, is this getting worse? Or do we just need to keep, keep monitoring, right? I, and again, the, it falls back on looking at these people as individuals. You know, it's nice that we we could come up with all these hard and fast rules that these are absolutes. A squat has to look like this and a bend has to look like this and a lunge has to look like this. When the reality is, it's like, okay, you know, if you got a tibia that's that, that's that long and a foot that, that that is that long and you got a, a six foot nine frame that has a vestibular system that's almost seven feet off the ground, right? With a base of support not much bigger than your own, um, you try to figure out how to move well, right? Mm. thanks bill yeah yeah i hope it was useful <laughs> yeah it's just it's it's a lot of like like, it's like you, you want know, rules like, don't you you want rules but, that you can stick to right <laughs> well it's just like it kind of like leads me to like so what do i do like if i see like what how do i know like what's what's to do <laughs> like in for a, a sky squat like it's kind of like at least we have more questions now. Yeah, there. I mean, and there always are. Just so you know, it doesn't get any easier. And, and again, I, that's why I always encourage people to, to to think broadly and 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 read, you know, as much uh, different perspective as you can. I, I don't think anybody has all the answers. And so, you know, every time you read something and you learn something, your model gets bigger, and and you have more options and more more uh, uh, or a broader uh, perspective that allows you to, to draw on different things. And so your, your right answers are not as absolute as they used to be. And you understand that there's more options. It's like, so what if you take the squat off the table, right? Like just eliminate it from the training program. Does he become a worse athlete because of that? Nope. And well, you, you, do you know that? But right now, and my question is, do you know that? squat out of the program entirely not worried about it at all continue to prepare him for his sport and does he get worse as an athlete okay so if he gets better or or stays the same then how valuable was the squat pattern as far as him being an athlete on the court if he gets better or stays the same then not very valuable at all okay so so maybe that's the experiment that you got to run it's like i don't really like the way this guy squat and so instead of trying to fix the squat pull it out just get rid of it, you know? So don't be afraid to do, do stuff like that, right? There is not, there cannot be one exercise that is so important that it has to be done by everyone in a very specific way, right? There are always other options, right? And so, you know, we, we have to continue to think that way rather than trying to pigeonhole people into these absolutes 
And, and we don't even know what the absolutes are, really, when you think about it. It's like, okay, what constitutes the perfect squat? What constitutes the perfect bend? You know, we're eyeballing these things. We can't actually see the, the relationships between the structures. We're, we're looking at the, the gross movement. And so, again, we have to, you know, trust our judgments, in, you know, in regard to what we see and within the 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 understanding that we have developed over time and that understanding gets better and, and again you'll see more and have more options in the future but the reality is it's like hey, if you're not sure whether you're doing something effective take it out see what happens right as long as the guy can play ball right that's the goal it's not it's not you're not trying to create great squatters you're trying to create great, great basketball players now if a great squat makes somebody mm -hmm. a better ball player then maybe that's the answer but otherwise who knows yeah, it's true. Hmm. Not thinking about it like that. Yeah. Again, I think everybody wants rules that that they can they can be absolute about, and and when you're dealing with humans, there's so much gray area. It's not funny. Yeah. Thanks, Bill. You're welcome, sir. Campo, you got another question? Um, I got a few. <laughs> Oops. Yeah, you open the box, man. Yeah. Um, uh, kind of depends on where you want to go. Do you want to continue with the compartment syndrome conversation? What's important to you? Uh, let's let's continue with the, the compartment most, syndrome. Let, let, so, like, hang on. Let's let's do this. Let, let's just say that that we're down to the last question. Yeah. Okay. And so what's, what's most important? What do, what do we need to discuss? I think when we were going along with the compartment syndrome conversation, mm -hmm. it was aiding in my understanding of how um, pressure both, both like intramuscularly as well as within the joint, as well as within different cavities is mm -hmm. creating what we're seeing. Mm -hmm. but let, let's continue along the lines with that. Okay. Um, so with that patient that you just recently had with the mm -hmm. laundry list of diagnoses, how was she presenting that um, created the increase in pressure in that anterior compartment? So um, what do you remember? Her, her center of gravity was shifted way forward. Okay. Like way forward. So she was living on the balls of her feet, right? Mm -hmm. And... Um, and she resisted the um, desire to compensate in the midfoot, right? So she's you, trying to pull her arch. She was trying to pull her arch up off the floor. So she was living in supination. Okay. So anterior tib is, would be so the she was, she was She was on almost uh, like you think about like, a, like an anterior compartment and a posterior compartment both being concentrically oriented. Yeah. Okay. And, and so that's where she became symptomatic and it was so variable. It was like this one day it was here, one day it was there. And like I said, they did the, they did the, the pressure testing and they did see elevations and then they exercised her and they saw way elevations. Right. Um, so, um, so she, she had, um, the environment in her lower leg was high pressure in both anterior and posterior as well. Absolutely. Simply Absolutely. because of her weight shift forward. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So technically, you know, pressure did increase, right? I mean, it was higher, but again, keep in mind that, that, that based on the way that she had to manage her entire system against gravity, she had to increase those pressures. Otherwise she collapses and she didn't, she wasn't comfortable um, doing so like some people will be okay. So those are the people that you're going to see with a navicular on the floor Those are the people that are going to that you're going to see with with a valgus knee and a posterior medial laxity You know in the in the knee joint Right um, there you're going to see the changes in orientation of the pelvis and like an internally rotated femur and they live like that And they're perfectly comfortable being there. Yeah, and she wasn't right. Okay, yeah so then if you, let's say you take her arch and make it low pressure, then she's only going to be experiencing high pressures in 
like posterior compartment, like gas Potent drop. No, potentially, potentially. Okay. You don't know. You don't know how she's going to react. Right. Because right? um, again, if, if you think about like a rear foot compensatory activity, so now I'm going to take soleus and I'm going to put that in, in, into an eccentric orientation. Um, I'm going to potentially take the medial gastroc and I'm going to put that in an eccentric orientation relative to the lateral gastroc. And so now you're just not really sure. Right. Because okay. again, it's like, it's like where the, the, like you have this, this potential series of compensatory activities that they're going to alter um, position and therefore the orientation of the, of the musculature. Right. Yep. Yeah. You just don't know. I mean, you, again, you have to kind of see what's in front of you um, rather than trying to say, Oh, this is what's going to happen. Cause we just, we can't be sure. Okay. You know? And then more, more proximally was it, just the higher pressures, more posterior, which was essentially like pushing her forward to begin with. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, so, so if, you know, if you go up, if you go up the chain, so, so she's got an axial skeleton that's in an exhale position with a compensatory inhalation anteriorly. Right. So now you've got high pressure posteriorly, you got low pressure anteriorly. So which direction is she going to go? She's going to follow low pressure, right? She's going to go forward. Yeah. She's great. Right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so the fix wasn't down in her feet. The fix wasn't down in the anterior or posterior compartment, right? right. Um, and that's what, that's what everybody was doing. So she had like dry needling and she had ART and they did all sorts of, sorts of goofy stuff to her feet and, and like nothing was working. And then, you know, so, you know, we taught her how to exhale and, and reorient her, her pelvic position and manage the pressures and you know in, in supine first and then we got her into you know various half kneeling positions and then we brought her to stand and she was fine hmm. yeah go, for, go figure and i'm not saying that that's the answer for everybody that 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 falls into this this category of compliance right. just for this one patient as an example right. right but you know who's to say that it's not a component that needs to be addressed more often um do you think also because of these more proximal structures, because they have an increased um, potential for higher amounts of pressure relative to like other areas of the body? So simply because they are... Can you be specific? Um, abdomen has more volume and thus more potential for... Um, amounts of pressure moved does that make am i making sense here or not really well I, I mean it's got more it's got a greater total volume right right but i don't know if you want to say it's got greater pressure because that's going to be debatable but it has the okay it's just got more volume per compartment if you want to go that way okay you yeah. know there's nothing special about the abdomen. I think it just does what it does. No, and, and I'm, I'm being serious. It's like there's nothing, either. there's nothing special. There's nothing special about the fluid in the gut because the fluid in any other synovial joint is going to behave very, very similarly. Right. right. Okay. Um, the, the, the thing that you gotta, you gotta be able to manage. So, so here's the really cool thing. So, um, been looking at embryology lately, and and so you know as the as the guts ev evolve through this embryological process, um, they can the reason that they're not attached to the to the abdominal wall on the on the on the inside of the abdominal wall, they're attached to the spine. They have a very specific purpose, and and they have to turn in opposition of the the exterior tissues so so the axial skeleton the muscular it surrounds it they have to be able to move in opposition otherwise we lose our balance okay yeah so, we, so actually, we actually use guts to balance with when we don't control guts to balance now we have problems so that's a big problem in fact it's a huge problem just like if i swing my right arm forward i swing my left leg forward mm -hmm. if i rotate to my right i guess my guts have to go left essentially initially yes and then they'll like then and then so so, so they spin right guts spin they 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 spin this way they spin this way and they spin this way okay 
Mm. So depending on which way you're moving, if you don't contain them well, right, you don't move well, right? So somebody who's got is rotating this way, away from them and forward, and it, and it goes outside that forward control of the center of gravity, they close off the back, they open up the front, and now you've just taken movement in other directions away from them. Okay. Right? Okay. Old people fall because they can't control their guts. So they give them four extra pegs in front of them to lean on called a walker. Now they have six points of contact. So there's no more rotation going on inside their guts. So they don't fall over. That's why they use that for balance. That's crazy. Yeah. How about that? We've been, it's like a national it? pastime in the, in the nursing homes, you know, it's like, uh, it's a big contest to see who can not fall. Yeah. Who can control their guts more. Yeah. 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 Is that why they give them not very dense food? I don't so there's know less that. that they have to. <laughs> I, would, I would imagine there's there's some some digestive issues and, and sure. some masticatory issues associated <laughs> with that. Um, well, we've been doing a lot of research on pregnancy lately as well, and uh, I, mean, I hope I hope not the kind that just came to mind. No. <laughs> okay. No. Good. Yeah. I'm sorry. I just I just remember when you were an intern, so I, that you know that that's my first thought. Oh, perfect. I've matured since then. It's been a right. few years. Yeah, you grew facial hair. That's all I can say. <laughs> okay. What um. Right? Well, just the fact that with all the increases in like blood volume, as well as the fact that you're you know growing a fetus, as well as the added fluid in that abdominal mm -hmm. cavity, as well. It's. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, the the changes in pressure and I'm sure such like a short time, like it's easy to understand why like, you know, low back and pelvic pain rates in that certain population are sure so high. Sure. You know? Sure. Absolutely. What's your question about that? I don't, I don't know. It's just like, you're a just making a, realization. Making, a bold, making a bold statement where I well, I mean, I'm I'm connecting dots here. I mean, come on. Yeah. Okay. So, but what? But what a great example of an extreme, right? Yeah. Okay. And so, you know, you look at the compensatory activities associated with 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 pregnant women, especially very very late in the pregnancy. You know, when the 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 center of gravity is going like way forward and mm -hmm. way down, and and so. I mean, you know, gravity works, right? We talked about that before. And so how are you going to manage that? You know, you're gonna, and it's going to be the same rules that we would use for anybody, but you just got to understand that, that, okay, we're just dealing with a much, much stronger force to deal with here. And, you know, that's why it is such a big deal that, that, that these, um, that these women take very good care of themselves. Right. And it was throughout this whole process. So they do have some adaptability remaining, you know, so they're not, you know, suffering from, from a lack of variability where, where you have this continuous pressure and continuous tension on tissues that eventually become a pain experience. Sure. Yeah. yeah it's good. Lance. I think I'm sense. here. Okay. Yeah, there yeah. you are. There he is. I hooked up another mic. Okay. Um, Thank you for doing this, Bill. Oh, you're very welcome. It was fun. I get to talk about fun stuff tonight. Yeah, Campo came loaded. He's been writing down those questions since the last time he was on. I've been I've been studying diathermy and low level laser, so it's been um there's been other things on my mind for sure. Stephen LaFlame. <laughs> First rule of diathermy campo is do not stand between the two big electrodes. <laughs> Apparently it's making a comeback. So there's um, and, of and, increased and, importance. Yeah. And maybe with, maybe with a decent reason actually. Yeah. 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 It, um, radiant energy has a lot of potential. So. So what a cliffhanger. So's the sun. How about that? The sun's going to be a good thing, too. Do 
Just when you read about the anti-aging properties of the sun in the early morning hours versus the midday hours. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Can we bottle I'm gonna bottle that up and sell it. <laughs> All right, team. Good job, guys. Until next Thanks month. Thanks for showing up. Thanks again, Bill. Have a good Cinco de Mayo, guys. Thanks, Bill. Bye.